Anyway, on the show yesterday, we saw a clip from CJ from a short film called Don't Be a Sucker from 1943. Actually, the 1947 re-edit remake of this film. CJ, do you have that handy? Can we pull that up again? I think it's short enough that it's worth actually watching uh, that clip again. In, in this article from Vox, it's got the whole uh, 1947 version, which is uh, 17 minutes, 26 seconds. But I think this, the, the clip that CJ had yesterday was, was a really good summary, right, Jim? We yeah. watched, so we, we looked for, we, we thought, okay, we're looking for a film. <laughs> so we did a YouTube search just for Don't Be a Sucker, because that's what that clip was. And we, we looked for the longest clip that was convenient. Wow. And there was a two-hour version. That's not it. That was something else. It was it was an actual army and it's U.S. Department of War training film. Um, but the and, and I think it's mislabeled on YouTube. Yeah, I think that one is actually called Sucker Bait, and it's just about how Nazi spies get information from American troops and goes to the theme of loose lips sink, sh sink ships. And there are a bunch of those original propaganda and not propaganda. Is that, that, that's a prop. I mean, it's not really that's loose not lips problem. sink ships. Is that a propaganda? That's propaganda. I mean, you're getting an idea out. It's not in and of itself devious. It's, it's a military security thing with, you know, obviously they shouldn't be, they're, they're getting security for something they shouldn't be doing in the first place. But, um, uh, the, the, the video that we're actually talking about, interestingly, comes from the same era. And we're going to get to this Vox article that provides some, some really interesting insight about the effectiveness of this and why we're hearing about it now and why it's gone viral in recent times. So, CJ, go ahead and please play that short clip. This is an excerpt from the 1947 version of the film, the whole thing being 17 and a half minutes. This one is, um, what, two or three, CJ? I happen to know the facts. My friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American-American. And some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign economy. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Do you believe in that kind of talk? That all makes pretty good sense to me. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know Masons. What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Thank you. Before he said Mason, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people. What about you? You aren't American, right? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us. 
made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. This, this is the kind, kind of thing, thing that, you know, really makes my heart swell with pride in Americanism. Not, not America. I, I, you know, yes, that too. But for the, the deeper ideal that to me is a, an important part of, of what this country is supposed to represent, the ideals behind it. So to the Vox article now, it's very important to examine, you know, the general effects of these kinds of things. You know, my, my undergraduate degrees in psychology, my enthusiasm was for social and, and behavioral and developmental psychology, but especially these kinds of, uh, you know, like studies like this with a survey that they're referencing in this article that get into the effects of something like this. So in the hours following the Unite the Right white supremacist rally in Charlottesville in August of 2017, a short propaganda film called Don't Be a Sucker, first produced in 1943 by the U.S. Department of Defense and then re-released in 1947, went viral on the internet, and in the months since, it's been repeatedly invoked on Twitter as a prescient harbinger of our current reality 75 years after its creation. Now, the Unite the Right rally, I like when CJ played this, I had no idea. You know, like, I, I was just like, well, yeah, it's relevant. It's kind of interesting that it's coming up, you know, but this is why. And I have, like, weird connections with the Unite the Right rally, where, you know, I have a, a former colleague who was heavily involved in that with Chris Cantwell and, you know, who, who calls me his favorite Jew while, you know, he was, this is the one with the Tiki torches where they're chanting, Jews will not replace us. And it was this, it, 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 it was, you know, really exactly like that dude in the video the, in, in, in black and white. I'm, I'm just a regular American, these jobs, you know, and, Jews will, it, it's this weird new American nativism that's this inescapable tribalist mentality that even if you say like, well, we're creating a tribe that's anti-tribalist, right? Like that's what America was. Like if, if you, if, you know, and, and, and as much as I want to look at history from the libertarian revisionist perspective, that includes the evil motives of the people organizing government and writing the history, the, the victors, right, you know, his story. Well, uh, and, and I don't mean that in a gendered sense. It's just, it's the victors. The victors write the history, right? They, they, and we, we are able to look back and see that that's not the truth most of the time, or that the truth is, is, is some version of that. And it, it usually reveals that in like in the case of American history, that the uh, people who wrote the Constitution uh, were doing something actually illegal under the Articles and creating a greater concentration of, of wealth and power, and that they, it really was an excuse to codify slavery, uh, central bank, taxation, a standing army, and you know intellectual property, all these other anti-freedom ideals baked into the Constitution that weren't in the Articles of Confederation. And it's when I watched this documentary, when you know, we watched the whole thing last night uh, with, with the crew here at the Garden of Freedom, and I recommend people go watch the, the whole version. It's a, it's a fun film, 17 and a half minutes. You know, I, I was not thinking, you know, about uh, the parallel with Unite the Right or, you know, where we are today. And what I was instead attuned to Especially hearing that guy's uh, talk, the, the, the Hungarian, the, the older gentleman on the park bench, to the younger guy hearing the speech, the Mason, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is, uh, the, uh, America did represent an undeniable, beautiful paradigm shift for humanity of, well, we don't need kings, we, 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 can, we can decentralize power, you know, even if we even if we failed to a large degree in the execution, right? And where we are today, certainly hard to say that we're living up to any of those ideals. So 
Created as a warning against creeping fascism and racism in the United States, the movie illustrates the divide and conquer method employed by German Nazis. It was originally created by Army Signal Corps to raise morale. Uh, edited version was later produced. This was the after the war version to be shown widely for educational purposes, including in cinemas. So there was a in, in a public opinion quarterly analysis of the film's effectiveness. And we're going to get into this study, and this is this is really a as as this article says, chilling to the negative effects of this. So skipping ahead to the section in the late 1940s, two researchers set out to study the limits of Don't Be a Sucker. At the film's more public release in 1947 and 1948, Cooper and Dinerman, working with the Department of Scientific Research of the American Jewish Committee at the Institute of Social Research, explored how viewers' attitudes were affected by the film, particularly those of high school students. Findings published 1951, they divided a group of high school students into a control and experimental group, right? One watched the film, one didn't. Four weeks later, they asked a questionnaire to both groups. There were questions related to the message of the film and, of course, control questions. And they divided up the answers by factors, including the participants' religious identity. Although, you know, when you go back to 19... Uh, 50, 51 or 1947, 1948, when they're doing the study, much less diverse, uh, you know, ideological crowd than we have today. So they mentioned Jews, Catholics, Protestants. So, you know, pretty simplistic breakdown, definitely leaving some people out. Each group responded strongly to the presentation of their particular religious group being isolated and persecuted by Nazis. The film also appeared to have an effect on American born Protestants who were somewhat prejudiced against Catholics and Jews after seeing the film. They were about half as likely as the control group to agree with the statement that in times of depression, it is only right that jobs should be given first to people born in America. So that's a that's a huge positive impact, right? At least in those demographics, major shift. Still, the numbers seem a bit surprising. After seeing the film, a quarter of the American-born Protestants in the experimental group agreed that people born in America deserved preferential treatment contrasted with fully half the same segment of the control group. So again, another you know positive shift, but not, not that big. But here's the surprise boomerang effect. Don't be a sucker desensitized some viewers to the threat of fascism in America. But the researchers also found a boomerang effect in their subjects, which they define as the film having the opposite of its intended effect. They identified four specific Boomerang effects that Don't Be a Sucker had on the viewers in their study. But the most interesting for our time is this. Cooper Dyerman discovered that students who viewed the film were more likely to agree with the statement that what happened in Germany under the Nazis could never happen in America. So essentially agreeing with the premise of the film. But then... It's a complacency effect. When the message was, hey, America, we got to watch out for this. This is something that human beings do. Although maybe the case wasn't made this broadly. It was, hey, this is something that happened in Germany, and it could happen here, too. We have a lot of Germans here. We have a lot of people with the same, you know, inclinations. But we got to be better, and we can be better. And then, how, you know, a chunk of the people go, yeah, we're better. Oh, we don't have to worry about that. I'm like, what? This is like, you know, idiocracy effect. And the funny thing, to connect it to the other film that we watched last night, it was showing Germans laughing. Like, it, it, was, and it was American actors in a U.S. department. It was obviously American soldiers pretending to be Germans, pretending to be Americans. Sorry for this confusing sidebar here. Just remember, this is a related film that was just a training film for U.S. soldiers that you can also find on the internet now. And it shows them playing these German 
officers laughing at Americans and how much they're sucker, you know, letting, you know, and, and, and in a sense you go, crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, America does have an overconfident complacency arrogant streak almost that does have this negative effect. So this is actually, so the box now says, this is actually the direct opposite of the film's intended message. The researchers attribute it to the fact that, well, don't be a sucker takes pains to show the extent of the Nazis' cruelty. It only showed one parallel to 1947 America, a man on a soapbox in square, ranting about foreigners and Negroes to a skeptical crowd. You know, so that's the thing is in the documentary, maybe, maybe they screwed up in the scripting and saying and showing that when someone tried this in America, they're talking to a diverse crowd and there's they show there's a black man. in the you see, saw that in the clip, right? There's a black man in the audience going like shaking his head. going, Tunnel. And it's not like the people, the white guys next to him are going like, yeah, lynch this guy. They're just like standing next to him, taking in the words. So. um. Though the American was going to say only the German commanded the respect of a crowd. One man seems half convinced by the argument, Mike, but the subjects of the study found him weak, gullible, and passive. Mike only balks when the soapbox speaker rails against Masons. Mike himself is one, but he is quickly talked down by the Hungarian refugee. The implication to many viewers was that American fascists are ineffectual and silly, quite different from their German counterparts no matter how similar their ideology might be. The uh, studies showed that students saw the man on the soapbox as a lame brain, someone who smart Americans knew to be a fraud and not worth their time. So they tested the statement with their questionnaire by including the statement, in America, hardly anyone would listen to a man trying to spread race hate. And to their surprise, they noticed the definite boomerang effect of word complacency among the students who were less prejudiced against people who were different from them. So maybe, yeah, so here's the number, 29% of the students who had seen the film agreed with the statement compared to 19% in the control group, uh, which was quite startling. So the statement being in America, hardly anyone would listen to a man trying to spread race hate. So, I mean, maybe the, the, the film would have been more effective if what they had done was shown a group of these people, you know, splitting off and forming a KKK chapter. They have a cooler term. The KKK has all the silly cool terms, right? Grand Wizard and Dragon. Yeah, all, all, their, all their silly titles, right? So, of course, the student, the study participants were high school students whose lives had so far been dominated by the looming threat of Nazis over there, but who as teenagers had naturally been immature in their understanding of the ideas that caused the heinous violence and who had driven the conflict. They'd become desensitized. Well, you know, back then, you got to remember also that the amount of information that you got was much narrower, not just a lower amount of information. I mean, yeah, I guess... You get as many books and, and then newspapers to read as you could in a day, but it was a, a narrower scope of news by a long shot and a much more controlled flow of news back then. And so here's the here's the uh, you know the conclusion that they draw with this article: Americans haven't stopped thinking they're too good to be taken in by fascist and racist ideas. Cooper and Dinerman's paper goes on to evaluate the way Don't Be a Sucker delivers its message, the limitations of its casting and its audience reach, and how future films of that ilk might convey their arguments more effectively. But two of their insights in particular seem striking in the context of today's resurgence of white nationalist rhetoric. Don't Be a Sucker's viewers thought Americans were too smart to be taken in by fascists, and they were reluctant to draw parallels between Nazi rhetoric abroad and racist anti-immigration rhetoric at home. You could hear echoes of this during the Charlottesville events in 2017, where there were expressions of shock over events that many people had forecasted. The this is not us hashtag trending on Twitter that insisted the white supremacists who gathered in Charlottesville are not representative of most Americans or the president's initial refusal to specifically condemn the white supremacists who marched in his name. Both well-meaning and more pernicious sentiments abounded that Americans are better than this 
that the so-called are alt-right are poor and ignorant rather than well-off and educated that the actions of the Confederacy during the Civil War and of neo-Nazis today are anomalies and the perpetrators should go home. But Joe Tolentino at The New Yorker wrote following the rally, the belief that America is somehow better than its white supremacist history is sometimes an excuse masquerading as encouragement. And it's part of the reason why the KKK is back in business. What happened in Charlottesville is less an aberrant travesty in a progressive enclave than it is a reminder of how much evil can be obscured by the appearance of good. To be wooed by authoritarian, fascist, divide and conquer rhetoric is to be a sucker. But to think we're too smart to be fooled that it's only crazies and lunatics who fall for this stuff is what makes suckers of us all. And I would never take the historically devoid perspective that suggests Trump is as bad as Hitler and that, you know, we're on the verge of another World War II and Holocaust or, you know, whatever the greatest evils of humanity under this are, because you have to keep in mind the progress of humanity as, you know, the decline in violence described by Harvard professor Steven Pinker makes undeniable that as bad as it was then, it will never be well, it'll 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 overall the overall trend. I, I gotta you gotta be careful with this, right? It's a jagged line that when you zoom out is a clear, you know, uh, exponential decline in human violence. We're living in the most peaceful times in human history, and that's a beautiful thing to celebrate. As Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat when it rhymes. And there's the old adage, you know, the one thing we learn from history is that we never freaking learn from history. When you say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, I think, think of a, you know, it's, there's a cycle, right? There's, a, there's a, a lifespan of empires that's part of this spiral, the Roman Empire, the, well, the Persian Empire, the, I guess, I guess you go back, I mean, throughout history, I mean, even off the top of my head, you go back to, to the great Mongol hordes of, of Attila and the Chinese empires and even the the empires of Africa, uh, before you get to the Roman Empire, before you get to the British Empire, before you get to the Soviet Union, before you get to the United States. There's a spiral of progress, of ascension that's happening. And I would argue that with each revolution of this spiral, of this turn of human events, the gap between the rings gets bigger and bigger. We learn more and more meaningful things with each cycle of history. And it's not that Trump represents an aberration. It's just, oh yeah, we're going around to that crappy part of the cycle again, where this tendency of nativism, of nationalism, of tribalism is rearing its ugly head. And I, I, I don't see Trump's na brand of nationalism or the nationalism behind him having the momentum or the, or the room to, 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 to ignite a bigger fire of, of hatred in society. The fuel's not there. The ignorance isn't there. The lack of perspective uh, of communications technology, of being connected by the World Wide Web. When was the last time you heard it called that instead of just the <laughs> w www dot <laughs> we don't even say that anymore right look how far we've come now obviously there's there's a bigger point of look how far we've come and i'm i'm excited to cover this with a slightly more optimistic perspective and say well now we're learning uh, oh yeah now now we're correcting on this point too and in so many other ways history doesn't repeat but it rhymes humanity progresses we're at that rhyming point. Perhaps the, perhaps the point of the spiral we are at is the end of the sentence in which it rhymes with the prior sentences. And the sentence is a spasm of hate, a spasm of division and nationalism and tribalism and division, followed by an uptick 
that puts us on a course to make sure that the distance between the next punctuation point and the one prior is further than the gaps before it. That's a pretty exciting positive spin on this troubling era that we find ourselves in the midst of. 